Welcome to the house of the Lord. As we worship together, let the Lord's presence be among us. How can a young person keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I trust that each of us has hidden God's word in our hearts, in our spirits. And we're never too old to memorize scripture. It just gets harder. <laughs> but we're not too old. And uh, I've gone through phases of memorizing psalms, different psalms. And so I've pretty much got one and eight, well, we all have 23 and 100 and 19. So it's never too late to memorize scripture and other scriptures as well. But we need to hide it in our hearts. That's what uh, the uh, Psalm 119 tells us to do. So we welcome here. It's good to see each of you. And uh, we'll have a moment of quiet and then we'll have prayer. ask you to be with us, to be in us, to be among us as we worship you, as we honor you, as you reveal the written word to our hearts, we give you thanks. We thank you that you comfort us in times of distress. We thank you that you teach us when we need to be enlightened. We thank you that you guide us when we have to make decisions. And so we welcome you today and pray that as we reflect on the goodness and wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that you will indeed touch each of our spirits, touch our hearts, and encourage us and strengthen us. We pray through Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Join in singing and worship. It's really a prayer, but it's a worship hymn. Spirit of God, fall upon my heart.
there something you would like to share today? A praise, a thanksgiving. Good ones for baking and some good ones for eating. Just wash them first. Well, thank you. That's very nice. Praise the Lord for good fruit. What else? Amen. <laughs> and we missed uh, Helen last Sunday. Glad you're here today, Helen. I'll see you again on Wednesday. <laughs> it's my week to do another Hinsing at the retirement home on Wednesday at 1 o'clock. So. Someone else? Well, I'm glad to see the band is here today. Are we doing the music at home? Oh, yeah, we are. I missed that the last time. We weren't here. Oh, yeah, there were no children here, so we didn't no, do it. we got the whole band here. Now we got the whole band here. Yeah, very good. We'll make lots of noise today for you. Yeah. God is good? All the time. All the time? God is good. Amen. Well, uh, if you want to come and sit up here with your friends. Um, today I'm going to talk with you about your favorite subject, school. <laughs> you like school? Everybody likes school? Carson likes school? Good. Did you have, did he have separation anxiety from mom? No. Did mom have separation anxiety? No. no. <laughs> what a silly question to ask the mother of the fourth work. child. <laughs> I feel weird walking home by myself. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus is interested and wants us all, not just you five children sitting here, but all all of us to keep learning and school is all about learning and uh, and the bible says that uh, we should as i was saying at the beginning we should hide god's truth in our hearts now it means in our minds obviously right because that's where we put stuff that's where our memory our brain is what does the memories but the bible uh, says in our hearts because it, it has to be deep in our lives and so when you're in Sunday school and you're memorizing a verse maybe sometimes that's that's wonderful to memorize uh, a verse and, and, and like you, you don't memorize in school anymore do you, do you memorize much in school no. No, we used to memorize we used to have to memorize when we were in school right everyone yeah, I think when I was in, anybody in grade four, are you? No, you're in. No, you're, in you're, you're in three. Okay. I think when I was in grade four, I, I learned a poem that starts, and it's a fall poem. Remember, you might remember it. Along the line of smoky hills, the crimson forest stands, and all day long, throughout in autumn lands, throughout the blue jay calls. And there's more of it, but I don't remember the rest of it. But, see, our memories are a gift from God. The, the part of us in our brain that remembers, that's a gift from God. And, you, and we need to thank him for that and fill it with truth from God's word. And that's why you come to church. That's why you come to Sunday school. That's why you have Bible stories to read at home, probably, and, and, uh, and, and talking about how Jesus loves you and cares about you 
and welcomes you into his family. So um, keep learning, be happy to go to school, maybe not every day, but most days, right? And uh, there were a couple of years we didn't go to school too much, right? When we had COVID, lockdowns and all that. But now you're back in school and that's all good. So God wants us to keep learning. And that's for everybody. Right? Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you that you have given us our minds. You've given us a brain that is functioning and working and remembering. And I pray that each of the children will be storing in their minds your truth, that you love them, that Jesus loves them and is with them every day, and that school is a good place to learn and to grow and then to learn more about you. So bless each of the children today and help us all to keep learning. Amen. Amen. So, you're going to learn some more, right? With somebody who's the teacher today. Oh, we have a song first. Oh, yeah, and Martin wants the, the yeah, instruments, of course. We have a song first, so we give out the instrument first. See, we have an old man up front. It's, uh, don't remember everything. Okay, I'll take a couple of these big things out. So you can, is that a shaker or is that something you. Oh, you got the triangle. Now you have to find the. the I'll come back to you when you get the stick. So there's there's the striker. There's the shaker. Oh, a rattle. That'll make good music. There we go. Good. So.
There we go. Looks like we got two leaders today. Wonderful. Uh, not yet. Not yet. We're doing one more thing if you check the bulletin. Um, since COVID uh, locked down your church, um, we haven't been bringing the offering to the front. So the suggestion was made. I, that I hope you've all got your offering in. I didn't play, but you can put it in afterwards if you don't. Um, one of the brothers at uh, Forks wrote, he says, I don't put my offering in until the end to see if it's worth it or not. <laughs> but I know he's joking. I know he's joking. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we're going to have the offering brought to the front, and we're going to sing the doxology. Praise to the Lord. So, Doug, will you do that, please? Get the offering played out in the foyer. people. We thank you for sharing uh, with out of our money, out of our income, out of our pensions, to bless your kingdom and to bless the work of this church. And so bless these gifts, these offerings, and may they be used to glorify your name. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we'll have Thank you. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today's first scripture is Psalm 111, and it can be found on page 640 of your Bible or on the screen. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and in uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. We'll now have a moment of quiet reflection. <laughs> Apparently I like Matthew. <laughs> <laughs>
That's why I married one. <laughs> you're in Matthew too, it wouldn't be under Christmas. Either. It is, and I was like, what does this have to do with uh, the first Christmas? Matthew, Mark. Mark 2, uh, verses 1 to 12. And I'm going rogue here, so please forgive any uh, no, wonders no, I make. There are no, there are no big words. Good. <laughs> So, Mark 2, verses 1 to 12, found on page 1046 of the Bible or on the screen. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four of them, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat with the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next hymn might be a new hymn. It's a wonderful hymn. You think it is, Grace? It's new. Okay. Um, but it's a wonderful hymn, and the chorus is, is an invitation of the Holy Spirit to, to be upon us. So it tells a story of, of Pentecost, and then it tells a story in the second verse about the old revivals that came across uh, people. And so I hope you enjoy learning it. It's an excellent hymn.
Well, we'll have to use that hymn again so it gets uh, fastened in our brain, right? Because it is a great message. It's a great hymn. And we all need continuously to have the Lord uh, refreshing us and in the old word, reviving us so that we walk with him. <clears throat> Last Sunday, uh, I only told God outside. Last Sunday morning when I got up, and I got awake, even before I got up, I knew I had vertigo. And uh, when I stood up out of bed, I had to sit down again. Anyway, I got up and got my hand on my chest of drawers and got going. And it stayed with me right through the couple hours getting ready. But it has never bothered me when I drove, when I've driven the car. Because a couple of times I've gotten it when I've been away from home, and I had to get home. One time I was uh, doing grief work with a, an elderly woman who, whom I knew, and I knew she would panic if I told her, because I was sitting directly across from her in her living room, and I knew this frail little woman about this tall, she would just be in a panic if I told her that I had vertigo, but I knew I had vertigo before I tried to stand up. Unfortunately, she went out ahead of me to her dining room and to her kitchen so I could sort of <laughs> grab my boots on. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I drove out of her driveway and then I stopped along the road to see if I was okay to drive. And I felt okay, so, so I, I went home. But anyway, last Sunday, I did tell Doug outside uh, that I had a little bit of vertigo yet. So I stayed close to the pulpit last Sunday. So that if I needed to, I could, you know, steady myself on the edge of the pole. But I was fine. And I got to Forks Road and everything. And I felt pretty good. And a little tinge of it yet on Monday. But it's been gone ever since. And so I told the uh, Forks Road congregation at the end of the service that I had had that. Uh, about eight years ago, I had a really bad Sunday morning vertigo attack. Really bad. And I was nauseous that day. Really bad. But um, anyway, so I don't get them often. I have no idea why. Apparently it has to do with your inner ear. And something goes, hey, why are you late on one side too long? I don't know what it is. But anyway, I feel fine today. The only thing that I run out of voice and get squeaky, but that's all right. So today I'm talking about the stretch of bears. And you caught on from the reading. The four men. Uh, do you know their names? Why not? Because it's not in the Bible, right? And probably some church or other has made up traditions, traditional names for them, like the like the Magi. You know, they all have names, but they're just made up names. Anyway, no, we don't know their names because. They did a job. They did a service job carrying their friend on a mat or a stretcher. Uh, probably they had a stretcher of some kind, a couple poles with a mat on it. And likely they took the poles out when they had to lower them down uh, through the roof. You know, buildings all of them had flat roofs, so that's why they could dig a hole through and uh, let them down. But they were determined. They were kind, and they were unknown. No, we don't know who they are. Moses was conducting a war, and uh, do you know who held his hands up so that he uh, could, as long as his hands were up, they were winning. And uh, when he put his arms down because he was too tired, they were losing. Who held his hands up? You might know. It's in the Bible, <laughs> but you don't know. Pardon? Aaron. Yeah, Aaron. Brother. And the other guy was, uh, I can't think of his name. Three-letter name. Yeah, not her. 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 Yeah, 
Her, H-U-R. Good for you, Bruce. Her. Good, good. But, so at least we know that Aaron is well known. But her, I don't think we hear of him ever again. So he's an unknown, basically. You don't know anything about him. Who gave their jewelry to decorate the temple which Solomon built? You don't know. Hundreds of people, thousands of people gave their jewelry so that it could be beaten into gold leaf and all the things that was reshaped as. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, Paul says, some people have a spiritual gift or ability. Remember, I've been talking about that. If you've been here, I've been telling you, every one of you has at least one special ability from God with Christ in your life and the Holy Spirit in your life. At least one. And here in Second in First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, some people have the special gift of helping others. Do we list these people? Do we know who they are? No, we don't. Do we recite their names in the Hall of Fame, in all these Halls of Fame? No, we don't know who they are. But where would the life of any organization or any church or any country or any business be without the hundreds and thousands of unknown, unnamed volunteers and people who work there? That's very important. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 22 says, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. So if you have this gift of helping others, you are indispensable to this church. This church, any church, will not survive without you. And Peter Wagner, who, the late Peter Wagner, who was a well-known writer, uh, said that there are three types of helping gifts. Mercy and helps, and the third one is serving. Well, here's a little, here's a little chocolate. We can have the chocolate before we go on. During a water safety course in Sydney, Australia, a swimming instructor received this note from a worried mother. Melanie will not be going to the pool until she learns to swim. <laughs> well, you know, you all have to learn what your spiritual gift is. And the only way to learn it is to practice. Is to practice and experiment. And when you find one that makes you feel really uncomfortable, you say, well, that's not my spiritual gift. And you find things to do that are really comfortable, then it's your spiritual gift. When we went to our first church in 1966, uh, the previous pastor, his wife, had been the Sunday school superintendent. And the pastor before then, she had been the Sunday school superintendent. So everybody assumed that Ruth Ann would become the Sunday school superintendent. And that lasted for three months. And about the 1st of October, we went the 1st of July. About the 1st of October, we were heading, we were all ready for church. There was a parsonage right beside the church. And we were going out the back door to go to the church. And she turned around and said, I can't do this one more Sunday. Because being up front, for her, that is not her gift, whatever. It was for the two previous women. It absolutely was. I knew it wasn't that. But not my wife. My wife is more the kind of gift that we're talking about today. The gift of serving others. And so, whatever your gift is, you have to experiment with and find it. So first of all, the gift of mercy. This is to feel genuine empathy and compassion for individuals, both Christians and otherwise, 
who suffer distressing physical, mental, or emotional problems, and to translate that compassion into cheerfully done deeds that reflect Christ's love and alleviates the suffering that the person is experiencing. This is built basically by one-on-one -on -one relationships that we make in our lives. Practical deeds of love. To be practical does not mean to be unspiritual. Some people just separate, you know, the two things. And it's wrong to separate the two things. To be practical doesn't mean to be unspiritual. Many very, very spiritual people are very practical, and that's how it should be. Those who are ill, people in prison, the blind, the deaf, people in poverty, seniors, the senior seniors, shut-ins, people who have, who have physical handicaps, people who are mentally challenged or mentally ill. They all need one-on-one -on -one care. They all need mercy. People who seek opportunities to show that they care for those who are miserable in their human condition. Because sorrow is universal. If you love, you will end up with sorrow. And we don't think about that when we're young and love and get married and all that, but you love and get married have a family, eventually we'll have sorrow, one way or the other. So hospital volunteers, visitors to prisons, when I, we lived in Toronto, when I pastored the church in Scarborough, I became a member of a board that ran a prison ministry. It was called Man to Man, Woman to Woman. And we found male volunteers who would visit male prisoners, and we found women who would visit women prisoners, man to man, woman to woman. Meals on Wheels. Our next door neighbor in our apartment building in Gilead Manor gets Meals on Wheels delivered to her three days a week. That's practical care. Not dramatic, doesn't go in the record books. Wiping the brow of a person who's dying, keeping a cool cloth on their forehead, whether they're at home, or in the hospital. I've done that many times. Nurses and nurses' aides. Cancer drivers. Wonderful people. I have a nursing story here. Written by uh, Rebecca Pipper. A young nurse learns something. In an article on Campus Light, a young nurse writes of her pilgrimage in learning to see in a patient the image of God beneath a very, quote, distressing disguise. Eileen was one of her first patients, a person who was totally helpless. A cerebral aneurysm, as a broken blood vessel in the brain, had left her with no conscious control over her body. As near as the doctors could tell, Eileen was totally unconscious, unable to feel pain, and unaware of anything going on around her. It was the job of the hospital staff to turn her every hour to prevent bed sores and to feed her twice a day what looked like thin mush through a stomach tube. Caring for her was a thankless Ask. When it's this bad, an older student nurse told her, you have to detach yourself emotionally from the whole situation. As a result, more and more, the patient came to be treated as a thing, a vegetable. But the young student nurse decided that she could not treat this person like the others were treating her. She talked to Eileen, sang to her, encouraged her, and even brought her little gifts. One day, when things were especially difficult, and it would have been easy for the young nurse to take out her frustrations on this patient, she was especially kind. It was Thanksgiving Day, 
And the nurse said to the patient, I was in a cruddy mood this morning, Eileen, because it was supposed to be my day off. But now that I'm here, I'm glad. I wouldn't have wanted to miss seeing you on Thanksgiving. Do you know this is Thanksgiving? Just then the telephone rang, and as the nurse turned to answer it, she looked, she looked quickly back at the patient. Suddenly she writes, Eileen was looking at me crying. Big, damp circles stained her pillow, and she was shaking all over. That was the only human emotion that Eileen ever showed any of them. But it was enough to change the whole attitude of the hospital staff toward her. Not long afterward, Eileen died. The young nurse closes her story saying, I keep thinking about her. It occurred to me that I owe her an awful lot. Except for Eileen, I might never have known what it's like to give myself to someone who cannot give back. That's the gift of mercy. Organ donors showing mercy. I know a number of people who have had organ donations. I hope that you have your card signed. I have never signed mine because I've had cancer. And I don't think they would take anything because nobody wants to get cancer cells. <laughs> but if, you, if you're fairly healthy, sign your organ donor card. I helped drive a woman named Nancy from the Ridgeway area to Toronto General Hospital over a period of maybe three years to hoping to get a double lung transplant. And uh, she it was it's a big it's a rigorous process. It is very demanding for a sick person who's carrying an oxygen tank on her back 24-7 and all the way to there and all that. It is rigorous. It's tough. Anyway, uh, she got one in September of 2018, I think. She was called in August, and then we went there, Aaron drove her, and the lungs were no good. So back home. She got called in September, uh, and uh, she, she got the transplant. And she lived for two years. She had complications and struggle and all that, but she lived for two years. Who gave her those, who gave her those lungs? After she got lungs, I know she prayed that she would get them. And all kinds of people prayed that she would get them. But I said to her, I could never pray that, Nancy. What do you mean you couldn't pray that? I said, because I could never pray that a young person would be killed. I just couldn't. It was, it's a big sacrifice that comes with transplants. Now, if you die of sort of natural causes or whatever, that's another story. But living people give their kidneys to people. I've known, of, uh, I personally have known two donors who have given to their brother one in two separate instances. The gift of mercy. Maybe you have it, where you have, can practically care and show mercy to people. Then there's the gift of helps. This is to invest the talents you have in the life and ministry of other members of the body, thus enabling the person help to increase the effectiveness of his or her spiritual gifts. And the most obvious one is a good Secretary, Grace, <laughs> is a good secretary. Um, I had several secretaries in Toronto in our church, and, but at Shurston, I was there 13 years as the lead pastor, 
And we had, I had the same secretary. She had been two years before. So she was there two years, and then all 13 with me. And this is exactly what she did. She enabled me to increase the effectiveness of my spiritual gifts. And that's what a person with the gift of health does. And they are blessed. Secretaries and administrative assistants and so on. Uh, for evangelists and pastors and mission directors and so on. Editors and ghost writers uh, all um, need a person like this to let them be free to use their gifts and not be tied down uh, doing other things that someone else can do more effectively. Uh, editors need uh, ghost writers. Authors have ghost writers. All authors don't write all their own books, you know. They have people who help them. And so do speakers. And so do politicians. They don't write all their own speeches either. So people have this gift of serving so that others can do more and do it well. And that's the gift of helping. Then there's the gift of serving. To identify the unmet needs involved in a task related to God's work and to make use of available resources to meet those needs and help accomplish the desired goals. And the Bible's word for that person is deacon. Diakonos is the Greek word, and we just didn't bother to translate it. Deacon. And whether your church has deacons or not doesn't matter. Uh, but that's the word, really, that we use, minister. Minister. Not in the contemporary sense of Reverend Laura, but minister means servant. Servant. Deacon. In Romans 16, verse 1, Phoebe, a woman, is described as a diaconos. So, yes, in the Bible, there was at least one woman deacon. This is another quiet gift. Unknown, does not attract attention. It is task-oriented to benefit Christian institutions and their goals. And so you had a bake sale. Right? That was service. If you didn't think about it that way, but you had a bake sale. You've had turkey dinners, you've had beef dinners. Those are all service. Uh, maybe you have the gifts of that. Somebody, I don't know who necessarily, somebody also to do all of that has the gift of administration, right? To organize it. Uh, it might be that lady sitting there over there, I'm not sure. <laughs> you see, we all need to use our gifts, but in these big projects, we have gifts of service. Quilting, some churches do quilting. Hmm. Offering transportation to people, giving rides to people. But taking the, if you had a CD, you deliver CDs, so? If required. If, if requested. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know somebody who'd like a CD? Talk to CISO. Start a ministry. PSWs has this gift of service. I see them in our building, caring for people on a regular basis. They serve. Many other people, people giving nursery care, social workers, community services, the Salvation Army, the thrift stores. There's a thrift store in Port Culver, corner of West and Sharp. Take your stuff there. I'm advertising now. <laughs> all the money that they, all the balance that they get goes to charities. Um, I think they, this year, last year sometime, they gave $75,000 to help with Ukraine issue. That was only one part of it. So, there are all kinds of ways for you to use your gift 
of service. In 1 Corinthians 16, the household of Stephanus is described as devoted to the service of the saints. So, do you have one of these gifts? Gift of mercy? Gift of health? Gift of serving? They're all under the umbrella of this spiritual gift. Some people think that this gift, this spiritual gift, is the booby prize. You know, it's the lowest thing you could possibly get. Not at all, and it's not even the consolation prize. So don't say, oh, I'm just an usher, or I'm just, I just help in the nursery once in a while, if you had a nursery, or I just teach the children once in a while. I just, get rid of that term. Get rid of it. Wrong. If that's your spiritual gift, you need to stand up and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the gift of helping others, of showing mercy, of serving others. So we need to say thank you, Lord, for equipping me to serve others, for letting me help out in the work of your kingdom, for giving me the opportunity to wash someone's face, or in biblical terms, to wash someone's feet. Help me to do my very best with my gift of helping. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have endowed this congregation with many gifts of help. Thank you for the men and women who exercise the gift of mercy who exercise the gift of health, and who serve willingly and joyfully. Thank you for each one. Fill them with your spirit in a new way, that this gift that you have given them will be multiplied, and it will be such a rich blessing to this church and community, and to all of our family. Thank you for our country, Thank you for the freedoms we enjoy and all the riches of food that we have. We pray for our leaders that you will guide them and direct them in their decisions. We pray for your comfort to be extended to the members of the royal family as the queen is buried tomorrow. We pray for those who are ill Recovering, we pray for Pastor Laura that you will strengthen her and restore her health to her. We pray for Betty, who is still uh, recovering from her fall. We pray for Marilyn as she recovers from her surgery. We lift up all of these friends, members of the church, to you. For others who have needs that haven't been mentioned, we pray your mercy will be shown to them and your healing touch upon their lives. Here are personal prayers now in these quiet moments. Thank you for your presence with us today through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're singing a happy gospel song now. Channels only. We're just channels for God to get us out there in the community and get his love out there. So let's sing joyfully. <laughs>
So be open to the Holy Spirit flowing through you, to your family, to your neighbors, to those in need, and may you be a blessing this week to everyone. And if you need to especially have a quiet moment of prayer, then be seated afterwards and, and really invite Jesus to fill you with the Spirit as we have just sung. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the comfort and presence of the Holy Spirit be with each of you and all whom you love today and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.